Dr. D Flow. Hey, my name is Dr. D Flow, and welcome to the final video for building the hardware portion of the J Design. We will do a little bit of coding in this video in order to test the LEDs, but Jeff is going to have his own series on how to program these addressable LEDs with Python so you can achieve some of the effects that we did in the intro video. If you were able to assemble both the driver and controller board, congratulations. Now we're going to test and see if they work. We need to supply power to the controller board, so let's wire up the power supply. On the right of the power supply, we have our ground, neutral, and live, which is the input for our power supply. And on the left, we have our output, which is our 24 volts positive and negative. You can take any AC cord, cut it, strip off the black sheathing to reveal the ground, live, and neutral wires. Or you can buy a cable that's already been stripped from Lowe's. The colors of your live, neutral, and ground wires will depend on your location. You can Google the color codes or just click the link on my website. I cannot emphasize enough that you should never ever work on a live circuit, so make sure that all wires are unplugged before you start working on the power supply. When you turn on the power supply, a green LED should illuminate on the controller board. If it does not, you might have a loose connection on your DC-DC converter, so give that a quick wiggle. If it wiggles, resolder. With the power supply off, plug one end of an ethernet cable into the controller board and another end into one of the driver boards. If you accidentally leave your power supply on and you plug in your ethernet cable into one of the boards at an angle, there's a chance you're exposing the circuit to only 24 volts and not ground. Again, a green LED means the board is receiving power properly. Now we're going to purchase some addressable LEDs. They need to be driven by the WS2812 driver. I recommend going with RGB and not RGBW to ensure compatibility. NeoPixel is Adafruit's name for their WS2812 LEDs. These LEDs come in different densities, but I find 30 per meter to be perfect. Your addressable LEDs may have wires already soldered to them, or you may need to solder your own. Grab a friend, it can be hard to do with only one person. Use the screw terminals or solder to attach the LED wires to the driver board. On the driver board, there are two sets of three pins. Each set labeled A and B can power a maximum of 64 LEDs. However, you do not have to fill up all 64 of A before moving on to B. If you use screw terminals, then you're not going to be able to see the labels for the pins. So the top pin is plus, the middle pin is data, and the bottom pin is negative. I uploaded all of the inventor and STL files for the casings on my website. Use a USB mini cable to plug the fade candy into your computer. And make sure that the ethernet cables are fully seated in the connectors. It's time to download the software for the fade candy. Go to my website and click on the GitHub link. Go ahead and download the zip file. Extract. Open. Go into the bin folder and click on the FC server. The FC server is going to create a local host so that your computer can communicate with the fade candy. The first time you run the FC server, it will automatically install the driver for the fade candy. I already have the driver installed and it's still telling me to wait, so don't worry about this too much because the next step will let you know if it's actually installed. Open up your web browser and search localhost colon 7890 and this will bring you to the fade candy server. You should see your fade candy connected. If you don't, then the driver failed to install. Don't worry, your LEDs are not on the internet. This is only a local host. Make sure everything's plugged in, then go to test pattern, full brightness to see if your LEDs work. If your LEDs do not work, make sure you check the green LED on both the controller board and driver board. Also, you can take tweezers and wiggle the components on your board. If they wiggle even a little bit, this means there is a poor connection. Unfortunately, this is all you can really do though to troubleshoot without an oscilloscope. But I promise you, I've built 10 of these boards and all of them worked out perfectly. Let's take another look at the server. So how does your computer know how many LEDs you have connected 
And where are these LEDs? Which driver boards are they connected to? The JSON configuration file gives your computer this information. Here we can see it. The first important characteristic of this file is that it contains the definition of white point. So if I lowered each of these RGB values by the same amount, then you're going to lower your overall brightness. I can still change the brightness in the program I'm running. However, this white point is going to define the maximum brightness that your LEDs can achieve at any time. Next, we have the map, which tells your computer how many LEDs you have and where they're located. The default map assumes that you have 512 LEDs all in a straight line. It's okay to overestimate the amount of LEDs that you have. Say you only have 300 LEDs, but you use the default map. Well, it's okay, you only have to call the first 300 LEDs in your program that you're using. This next part is going to be a little bit confusing, which is why we have an entire video coming out on it, but I want you guys to be familiar with the mapping. To minimize the distance from the driver board to the LEDs, you want the driver board to be in between your 128 LEDs, 64 on the left and 64 on the right. However, this means that 64 LEDs will be running backwards. Unfortunately, the JSON file does not support reverse mapping, so we'll have to do this manually in our Python program. Here is the map that I used for my first 512 LEDs. You can see we have eight different rows, and each row corresponds to one of those two sets, A or B, on one of the four driver boards. You can play around with your configuration file by going to Examples, Config, and opening the default file with a text editor. There is also some documentation online for setting up this map array. Your map may not be configured correctly, but we can still achieve some really cool effects without having to do much programming. For this example, we're going to use Processing, which is an IDE with an emphasis on visual design. We are going to use a slightly older version of Processing, Processing version 2.21 to ensure compatibility with the protocol used to control the fade candy. This protocol is known as Open Pixel Control, or OPC. Once processing is installed, go ahead and return back to the fade candy folder. Go to Examples, and then go to Processing. We're going to go into the Strip64 Flames folder. There should be two files, the Open Pixel Control and the Strip64 Flames. Go ahead and open up the Strip64 Flames. You can apply the flame effect to all of your LEDs at once by switching 64 to the number of LEDs that you have. Next, press the play button. You should see an image of flame scrolling with a white line in the middle. The white line is representative of your LEDs. After doing all that work on the boards, it's nice to be able to plug it in, tweak the code a little bit, and already have some awesome lighting effects. What's really awesome is that the flame can be switched out for any image. I found this particular rainbow image to really show off the fact that these are addressable LEDs. All you have to do is save the image to the data file within the flame 64. Then change the file name in the code and that's it. I hope you were successful and learned a lot from the hardware portion of this build. We'll be releasing in-depth coding videos soon. Thanks.